going to hand over to Mel Ferrer. And um, Mel is a syncope and cardiac autonomic nurse specialist um, at the Sheffield Teaching Hospitals. And she um, leads one of the larger POT services in the country. And um, I've known Mel for a long time. Um, she's also a nurse volunteer for POTS UK. So over to you, Mel. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Leslie. Now, we're going to be a bit old fashioned with my slideshow because we couldn't get uh, my computer to share <laughs> properly. So Denise, I hope, is sharing my slides. I can and, do that. Um, yeah. I am going to be saying next slide, just like we used to in the old days. <laughs> um, so going, going back in time a little bit. So Leslie's asked me to do two talks, uh, one on sort of the diagnostics and then the other on medications. And um, Manoj is going to be sort of in between, I think. Uh, so next slide, please, Denise. Um, so... Hang on, I've lost my blooming picture now. Here we go. Let me put my picture down. Um, so I've labelled it autonomic dysfunction, or should I say orthostatic intolerance syndromes. There's lots of terminology around this, so I'm going to try and just explain it a little bit. So under the umbrella of orthostatic... Next slide, sorry, Denise. Under the umbrella of orthostatic intolerance syndromes, as Leslie's already said, comes orthostatic or postural hypotension, reflex syncope, postural tachycardia syndrome, or inappropriate sinus tachycardia. There are other very rare forms of uh, sort of autonomic dysfunction, but they are like hen's teeth, really. Next slide, please. So I thought to go through some definitions for people because there's a lot of confusion about what is what. So orthostatic hypotension is defined as a fall in blood pressure occurring on postural change when orthostatic stress overwhelms the autonomic defences. Now that sounds like a right mouthful, but in essence it means that the patient has to have 20 millimetres fall in systolic blood pressure or 10 millimetres in diastolic blood pressure after three minutes standing. And with orthostatic hypotension, there is a compensatory heart rate increase. We get a lot of referrals from GPs who are saying, asking us if the patient has POTS when they have a low blood pressure and low blood pressure causes a compensatory heart rate increase. Um, so it's just something to bear in mind, really. And then we've got initial orthostatic hypotension, which we see really frequently, particularly on tilt table tests, where the blood pressure drops on immediate standing. Uh, and then it sort of writes itself. And I would say a lot of patients we see in clinic complain of dizziness on initial stand that goes away that either by hanging on to something or sitting down. Next slide, please, Denise. So reflex syncope, this is slightly more complicated and it's got lots of names, which makes it quite confusing. So we've got neurally mediated syncope, neurocardiogenic syncope, and there are sort of three types under this umbrella. We've got the vasovagal, which everyone knows about, which is basically fainting. The body overacts to certain triggers, such as having blood taken, extreme emotional stress or prolonged standing. Then we've got your situational syncopes. The one we see most in clinic, I would say, is cough syncope, uh, particularly in patients that are large. Uh, then we've got swallow, laugh. We can get defecation syncope. There's one that happens on uh, planes called Romholtz syndrome. Uh, so there's all sorts of situations where this process can happen. And then we've got carotid sinus syncope, which usually occurs in the more elderly patients where if you turn your head or you've got a tight-fitting collar, uh, the carotid baroreceptors are quite hypersensitive and tend to overreact. So what happens in reflex syncope is that there is a reflex in the brain that's activated by your trigger and it causes overstimulation of the parasympathetic nervous system and then withdrawal of the sympathetic nervous system. So you tend to see fall in heart rate, fall in blood pressure. Now, it's divided into two, so it makes it even more complicated because we seem to divide in this in lots of ways. But we've got the cardio inhibitor response where there's a drop in heart rate leading to a decrease in blood pressure. And we've got the vasodepressor response where the drop in blood pressure happens with not so much of a change in heart rate, although it does tend to get lower. 
majority of people have a mixed response uh, with this. Next slide, please, Denise. So postural tachycardia syndrome is where the heart rate increases by 30 beats a minute on standing and is sustained within 10 minutes of standing in the absence of orthostatic hypotension. And this is where we, the confusion lies usually. There has to be symptom reproduction and the symptoms should have been lasting for three to six months. Next slide, please, Denise. And then we've got inappropriate sinus tachycardia where people have got symptomatic palpitations which correlate to a heart rate that's higher than 100 beats a minute at rest or a mean heart rate of 90 to 95 beats a minute, depending on which paper you read, basically. And it is associated with symptoms with no obvious cause. Next slide, please, Denise. So in our syncope for service, we looked at sort of what comes through the service. And you can see actually that the top three are related to low blood pressure. And that's, uh, hang on, 77% of people who come into the syncope service with problems due to blood pressure and POTS only 5%. So POTS is a very rare diagnosis, but I do think it's misdiagnosed in a lot of cases. And I'll go on to why it's important to get the diagnosis right or get the look at objective evidence because that's what you're going to be treating. Since COVID, and I haven't actually had time to look at these figures properly, but what I do know uh, out of the first sort of tranche of patients uh, with 50% had orthostatic hypotension and only one patient had POTS. But a lot of the patients that we saw, their symptoms had gone by the time they came to see us. And that's because obviously we've got a waiting list. But it does show that symptoms do reduce over time. Next slide, please, Denise. So although we have lots of diagnostic tests, the biggest and most important thing is the history. And so when taking the history, it's really important to rule out and consider other causes of the symptoms other causes of sinus tachycardia, other causes of passing out, and obviously ruling out a cardiac cause or a neurological cause of transient loss of consciousness. Oh, next slide, please, Denise. So in patients with syncope, pre-syncope and dizziness, it's very important to consider medications. Metazapine is the one that we seem to get a lot of patients on, and the, one of the biggest side effects from that is uh, postural hypotension, tamsulosin, particularly in older people, quite aggressively lowers blood pressure. And in fact, I saw someone in clinic a few weeks ago who said, oh, all my symptoms started since I started on this new tablet for me prostate. Um, and he was on tamsulosin. So um, obviously we need to rule out adrenal insufficiency. Having a low cortisol can lead to a low blood pressure. And then we're looking out for things like Parkinson's, multisystem atrophy, diabetic neuropathy. Vitamin B12 deficiency can cause neurological damage and dizziness. Um, quite commonly, you and you probably won't believe this, we see patients with anemia who are referred to us with dizziness. And then the other thing is low BMI and eating disorders is a common cause of these symptoms and actually needs treating uh, before we think about treating any of the symptoms because actually putting on weight and eating properly will stop a lot of these symptoms. Next slide, please, Denise. So increased heart rate on standing, really important to rule out uh, other causes of this. We commonly get people in our clinic who come to us who've been told they've got a high heart rate and they don't have any symptoms. If there's no symptoms, it's not a problem. It's when there are symptoms that we need to have a look at um, what's causing it. Now, the Canadian Consensus Guidelines state categorically that deconditioning, patients who are deconditioned with the sinus tachycardia should not be diagnosed with POTS. So we know that deconditioning causes sinus tachycardia, orthostatic hypotension amongst an absolute multitude of other problems. Um, so again, adrenal insufficiency, if you've got low blood pressure secondary to that, that will cause a high heart rate. Again, anemia thyroid dysfunction so that's really important the patient isn't hyperthyroid 
Uh, we've recently picked up one who was actually on midadrine and it's a contraindication to midadrine her hypothyroidism. And then we've got medications such as amitriptyline which causes high heart rate. And then a lot of the ADHD medications cause high heart rate. And that's tricky to manage, but it is manageable. Now, one of the most tricky things is anxiety and mental health issues, because of course they cause an increased heart rate. And over time, we've all had to gain experience in our clinic at looking at patients and, you know, wondering whether actually their mental health issues are the things that are causing the problems. And that's a very tricky situation. And we've had some quite awful things happen, really, I suppose, to some of our patients that we've diagnosed with POTS. And actually, it's the mental health issue that has been the significant issue, not the fact that they've got sinus tachycardia when they stand up. And then again, we've got low BMI and eating disorders that will cause high heart rate. And again, like I said before, that is a situation that needs to be managed. Next slide, please, Denise. So in terms of symptoms for patients who have transient loss of consciousness or presyncope, which is about the same thing, we're looking at the patient's got a prodrome, are they dizzy, lightheaded, sweaty, hot, with a visual or auditory disturbance um, before they pass out or become presyncopal. And actually becoming pale is a very significant symptom of transient loss of consciousness in people uh, with all static intolerance. Um, posture, have they been stood for a long time? Is it on initial stand? And in some patients with prolonged sitting. And then we've got also things added to that sort of after eating or post-exercise postural hypotension, which um, can also be a problem. So provoking factors, particularly in reflex syncope, we've got pain, medical procedures, emotional stress. We've sort of already covered that. So the length of time for transient loss of consciousness in patients with orthostatic intolerance is short. It's seconds to minutes. Now, if there's a little note on the bottom there, because a lot of patients that we see, and the neurologist will tell you 30% of patients with syncope have non-epileptic seizure disorder or functional syncope or whatever people like to call it. I quite like Leslie's um, term, non-hemodynamic syncope. It's sort of a bit more friendly. But these patients have frequent prolonged episodes of transient loss of consciousness and they get eye flickering, which often occurs, uh, the T-lock often occurs in postures, including lying. And what we often find with patients with um, orthostatic intolerance syndromes is they often get a functional overlay to the symptoms that they get, particularly if they've not been treated. Um, so the recovery, they're often tired or drained afterwards, but it's usually short, they're orientated quickly. Uh, so in orthostatic hypotension, it's a chronic problem. Like Leslie said, it happens frequently with reflex syncope, it's episodic. People with POTS should not be passing out because having a high heart rate should not lead to transient loss of consciousness. Um, so it's just patients who've got problems with the blood pressure that usually pass out. Next slide, please, Les uh, Leslie, Denise. Thank you. So... All the symptoms that patients get, feeling faint, dizziness and lightheadedness, and like Leslie said, with POTS, they are the commonest symptoms along with palpitations. And then people often get difficulty in breathing, feeling out of breath and chest discomfort uh, on standing up. And then, like Leslie said, they often get symptoms of brain fog, uh, fatigue uh, and all other sort of signs of autonomic, autonomic dysfunction. So with orthostatic hypotension, we've got the dizziness, lightheadedness, palpitations, and then POTS and inappropriate sinus tachycardia, all the other signs of orthostatic stress, really. Next slide, please, Denise. I think actually I can leave this slide because I think Leslie's already talked about it. So we'll go on to the next one. Thanks, Denise. I'm just aware that Manoj has got to um, uh, other commitments after he's done his talk. So with the tests, the aim is to correlate symptoms with objective evidence to support treatment and management. We do sometimes treat people empirically, but we strive very hard to find out what's happening with the heart rate and blood pressure when the patient gets their symptoms. Next slide, please, slide, please Denise. So one of the tests that we see uh, done, although we don't do active stand tests, uh, 
is obviously uh, this test is done by people who don't have access to tilt table tests. So the active stand test is done when a patient stood up, therefore the skeletal muscle pump is in action. And that's a sort of protective mechanism really, and helping the blood to return back to the heart. It's recommended that you lie for at least 10 minutes, and it's recommended that you do the blood pressure two minutes, five minutes, and 10 minutes on lying, then two minutes, five minutes, and 10 minutes on standing. I actually think that this will be incredibly inaccurate if you were to do that in that respect. You're likely to miss changes in blood pressure and heart rate by doing that. And we would recommend that you take the blood pressure and heart rate every minute at least for 10 minutes while standing. And for more accurate results, a portable thinner press is probably the best thing to be used. And a lot of patients, so the active stand test is really designed for for looking for people with POTS, but actually because the majority of patients have orthostatic hypotension, they sometimes don't have symptoms within that first 10 minutes. They have it a lot later on. And I've got a nice tilt table test to show you uh, with that in mind. So again, you need to be careful that when you do your active stand test, does the patient have the symptoms that they're telling you about? Next slide, please, Denise. So the tilt table test really is the gold standard test. It's much more accurate than any other test we have. Um, it inactivates the skeletal muscle pump by standing at 90 degrees, at uh, 70 degrees even. So in our institution, they lie for 15 minutes. So everything's settling down and you get therefore the heart rate and blood pressure and nicely uh, taken nicely when they're relaxed. And then the stand in various places can range from 10 minutes to 45 minutes. Here we tend to do a short tilt table test if the patient's symptoms occur on initial stand or within 20 minutes of standing. If the patient's symptoms occur on prolonged standing, they need a 45 minute test. And we've got beat to beat monitoring, uh, which is obviously much more accurate. We do still get tilt table tests uh, where patients have had got blood pressure cuff on and it's been documented every minute. And again, you sort of miss the subtleties uh, in that sometimes. GTM provocation is sometimes used. We don't use it. We find that you get a lot of false positive results from using GTM provocation. And it's very important if the patient has had GTM that you check that the symptoms they got when they have been given the GTM are the symptoms they usually complain about. Otherwise, it's a false positive. So I've got some tilt table tests to show you now. Um, next slide, please, Denise. So here's a tilt table test in someone with POTS. Where are we for time? We're all right. Um, uh, this is a young lad who actually who'd got diabetic neuropathy. And you can see his heart rate goes up on immediate standing and stays up and it's sustained for the whole sort of 30 odd minutes that he stood. He had his usual symptoms were reproduced and his blood pressure, although I don't have the graph because I wasn't able to get hold of the graph, will probably show the blood pressure's oscillating. So it's just sort of going up and down within the normal, um, so within the normal tensive range, but it's a bit unstable. And you can see there that there's a blood pressure 136 to 105, then it goes back to 118. Um, so that's the tilt with someone with POTS. Next slide, please, Denise. So here we've got a tilt. This is actually a patient with long COVID. Uh, she is a GP. She came to us asking for Evabradine and we said, let's do the tilt first. I'm glad we did uh, because one of the things, if you uh, give people beta blockers or Evabradine to suppress a heart rate, which is actually a compensatory heart rate to low blood pressure, is you'll just make the symptoms worse. Um, so she uh, had an initial drop of blood pressure on standing and then her heart rate was going up. But by eight minutes, the blood pressure had dropped to 75 over 54, it says in the text. It's not actually recorded. But that reproduced her symptoms as well, uh, particularly when the blood pressure dropped. So again, that's another um, example of orthostatic hypotension. Next slide, please, Denise. So here we've got a lady who actually 
when we first tilted her, she had orthostatic hypotension and we've treated her, but then she started passing out more. So we put her back on the tilt and she passed out with a normal heart rate and blood pressure. So again, this is one of these patients who gets a functional overlay uh, to their symptoms. And you can see in the comments at the bottom that the blood pressure and heart rate was stable, uh, reasonably stable. Just a little note really about higher blood pressures on the tilt table. The thinner press is very sensitive to low blood pressures. And when the blood pressures start to get a bit higher, it's not quite as sensitive. So we would usually do a 24 hour blood pressure on patients where the blood pressures become high uh, on the tilt. Next slide, please, Denise. This is a lady who came to us from the chronic fatigue service and been told she had chronic fatigue and that dizziness was part of her symptoms and she had to put up with it. Uh, now, you might think that this lady could get a diagnosis of POTS. So she does, her heart rate does go up when she stands up, but her symptoms don't occur till right at the end of this tilt where her blood pressure drops quite dramatically. Uh, for, to 75 over 54, and that's when she got her symptoms. So her diagnosis is orthostatic hypotension. And I think this is just an example of the uh, of actually making sure that the symptoms correlate with what you find. And then finally on the tilts, next slide please, Denise. Here's one of vasovagal syncope, but you might notice at the bottom, these were not the patient's usual symptoms. So in a way, this is a false positive test. However, I just put it up because it shows quite nicely what happens in vasovagal syncope. So she's the heart rate's gone up a bit as she's standing up and then the blood pressure and heart rate have absolutely crashed around 25, 26, 27 minutes. And in fact, she had a nine second pause which is quite common in people who are young because they have a very high vas uh, vagal tone uh, and on lying back down, the heart rate came back and the blood pressure resolved. Next slide, <clears throat> please, Denise. So the other tests that we use are halter monitoring and blood pressure monitoring. Now, I would recommend for patients with an active stand that they have a blood pressure monitor as well because sometimes, like I say, it's difficult to pick up um, low blood pressure in these patients because of the short standing phase. Uh, and the, we found 24 hour blood pressure in really helpful. We've been using it probably for about longer than five years. And actually when we went to Heart Rhythm Congress this year, there was a huge sort of like lots of presentations on using 24 hour blood pressure monitoring in these patients. Um, so it's very useful to spot people who are generally hypotensive or who have hypotensive episodes throughout the day. And it sort of complements the active stand as well. Uh, and we use it for midadrine monitoring as well. Halter monitoring, we basically want to make sure the patients haven't got an arrhythmia. And we're looking to correlate symptoms again. Uh, so ask for the monitoring appropriately. So if the patient doesn't have palpitations uh, every day, then there's no point in having a 24 hour halter. You can do it to exclude arrhythmia, I suppose, but what you need to capture is the symptoms. Um, and so what we do is we look at how often they're getting their symptoms and order the monitoring appropriately. Next slide, please, Denise. So here we've got a 24 hour blood pressure with a hypotensive picture. So you can see the average blood pressure is 92 over 64 and during wake periods, 96 over 69, and then it's a lot lower at night. This is a lady that we've really had problems treating, but she's got a very good demonstration of the overall summary showing hypotension. And then the next slide, Denise, shows us basically someone who's having hypotensive episodes. So you can see, if you can see, or you've probably got to get your nose right up to the computer to do this, that around five o'clock at night, the blood pressure is getting low. So um, that's usually the time when people are preparing a meal. And then you can see that the blood pressure is low overnight. And then it's low again, sort of from seven o'clock in the morning. So what we usually do with these is just ask the patient if they can remember uh, 
you know, what their day feels like and what their day felt like on um, on the day they had the 24 hour blood pressure. You know, did they do their usual day? Did they get up at their usual time? Did they go to bed at their usual time? And you can often find out, you know, sort of draw quite a few conclusions from that. Next slide, please. Oh, yeah. So obviously it's really important that if patients have a T-lock, they have an ECG. Uh, that is one of the um, gold standard tests that needs to be done. But then we would make sure that their kidney function is fine, that they're not anemic, that LFTs are fine, vitamin B12, like we've already suggested. We find that ferritin and folate are often low in these patients. And vitamin D, I haven't seen a normal one for six months at the moment since they changed the guidelines. So early morning cortisol obviously needs doing between one and two hours after getting out of bed, which is a tricky one, um, but that does need to be uh, okay. And then 24 hour urine tests. If we think the patient's becoming hypertensive uh, or there's lots of what patients call adrenaline rushes, then we'll um, do 24 hour urine tests for free metanephrines and catecholamines. And then the other 24 hour urine test we do is uh, in terms of looking at salt intake, which I think we might be doing later. Um, so we do a 24 hour urinary sodium uh, to see how much salt the patient's taking. So we're aiming for a 24 hour urinary sodium of 100, 170 uh, millimoles per liter to ensure the patient's taking enough salt. So they're, they're the other tests we do.